Welcome to the Digital Marketing Mentor. I'm your host, Danny Gavin, and together with industry leaders and marketing experts, we'll explore the meeting point of mentorship and marketing. We'll discover how these connections have affected careers, marketing strategies, and lives. Now get ready to get human. Hello, everyone. I'm Danny Gavin, founder of Optage Marketing Professor and the host of the Digital Marketing Mentor. Today, our guest is Joseph Wolf, who's the head of paid social at Optage. When it comes to marketing, Joseph's a veteran and is the longest tenured employee at Optage. He's currently on his sixth year. With a diverse background in B2C, Google Ads, and brand strategy, Joe spearheaded and developed the paid social department, which he leads and is also part of the leadership team, providing valuable input in the direction of where Optage is going. Outside of Optage, he recently joined the American Marketing Association of Houston's board. Uh, Using his analytical thinking and creative knack, he directs the strategy, develops the creative, and then analyzes and optimizes the performance of paid social ads. Along the way, he snapped up five Crystal Awards, as well as two HIMA Show and Tell Awards. Today, we're going to be talking about meta reps and media buyers, where they're not always right about social ads. Joe, how are you doing today? Doing great. Very excited to be here. It's been a long time coming. Yep. I know we've we've done sort of type podcasts for audio and different things like that, but I'm glad that we're able to have you officially on the Digital Market Mentor. Yeah, it's a big deal. All right. So let's jump right in. Let's first talk about where you went to school and what you studied. So yeah, I went to St. Edwards, um, got a bachelor's in marketing. My passion for marketing really kind of came about when I took an international business course in high school and had like the marketing section and kind of knew that I wanted to do business, but I thought, you know, business accounting and finance was pretty boring. So after I took that, you know, class and had experience in marketing, I knew that's what I was going to do and uh, went to St. Edwards, kind of fell in love with it more there. And then my first job out of college was kind of doing business intelligence. So it wasn't necessarily straight into marketing. It was more monetization and analysis, like imagine in-house business consulting. So kind of got my like analytical chops there and then ended up being able to come to Optage, where I got to actually work at a marketing agency. And I think the coolest part about you coming to Optage is, I think I remember that when we interviewed you, the big thing that made you stand out of other candidates was the passion that you had. I know that since then, like we've always, that's like been a really important aspect for us when we're looking to hire someone is, are they passionate about what they do? Because even if maybe they don't know everything yet, but that passion is going to take them to learn new things, overcome challenges, you know, working with an agency. You definitely brought that really big gift to Optage. Yeah. And you definitely enhance that with your passion too. And um, that's a big part of Optage is everyone supporting everyone's uh, passions and helping them achieve anything they want to dive into. So let's jump into the fact that meta reps and media buyers, they're not always right about social ads. In previous episodes, when it comes to Google ads, we've spoken about the concept of automated bid strategies versus manual bid strategies. We're going to talk a little bit about that now in the world of paid social. So a lot of big names in the, I guess, the meta world, or even in the paid social world, as well as reps themselves, are often pushing people to let the algorithm be in control. It's about, you know, there's only so much that you can do, but you really have to set it up in a way where, you know, Facebook or meta or any other platform where its algorithm can then go ahead and take what you have and and do do what's necessary. What do you feel about that for you know this sort of strategy, this sort of initial concept when someone is approaching paid social? Do you think this is true? Do you think they missed the mark? I, I really do think they're coming from a good place. They've had success with these strategies. And when I say these strategies, I mean, basically, in some scenarios, they're like, don't use any targeting, let the creative do its work. And in that scenario, it can work, but you have to be spending a ton of money. And Meta is like just pushing this a lot just because they they want to let people, they want the barrier to entry to be dropped so that anyone can really advertise on it. And, you know, for small like business owners, that can work to some extent. But really where this does work is when you have tons of money, you have tons of creative, you're an established brand. And if you don't have those aspects, it makes it really hard to basically let Meta just take the algorithm and run with it. So there's definitely some scenarios where it does play out. It can work really well, but where they've had success is not where, you know, people who have lower spend have really niche audiences and they really need to be able to target the right people. That is a lot harder to do. So Joe, are you basically trying to say that the point here 
is that the big media buyers or meta, they're not necessarily wrong, but the advice that they're giving on an overall level is not suited for every situation. Yeah, exactly. It really just comes down to your brand, the amount of money you have, and your ability to crank out creative. And most advertisers, you know, unless you're what we're talking about here, the big names, like you have to come up with an alternative strategy that's going to make it possible for you to target the right people with, you know, not having a massive creative arsenal to go to and really to be able to hit the learning phase, which where all this comes from. They want you to be able to hit the learning phase, which is 50 conversions in a seven day window. So if your cost per purchase, for example, is like a hundred dollars, you need to be spending like fifty thousand dollars in a seven day period. So it becomes really impossible for some of these businesses to do that. But yeah, there's some scenarios where it works, but most of the time in our experience, you have to do a lot of different strategies, diversification in your um, targeting, testing, and have a really good plan to be able to make it work when you don't have that high level spend. In order to like activate the automation, you need to get to a point where you're seeing a lot of conversions, you're spending a lot of money, and your average person may never even get to that yeah. <laughs> level. You mentioned the concept of like diversifying your campaign. So when you're not able to reach that like automation stage, what does it mean that you're diversifying your campaign in order to see results? Really, diversification means having like a diverse funnel. Some scenarios you want to be able to split your budget in prospecting, for example, between top of funnel collateral pieces, um, maybe quizzes, and then getting people in that way because they're not ready to make a purchase. But you also need to have a purchase campaign if you're doing e-com in prospecting, and then also having retargeting really dialed in, having a warm audience, which would be people who may be engaged on the on on Facebook or Meta, um, but haven't gone to the site yet, having people who've been to the site, but haven't converted on your end goal. Um, and then people who've maybe init- added to cart or initiated checkout, um, but haven't purchased and having those all segmented. So having a diverse campaign is important and you know, not just at a funnel level, but making sure you test different campaign types. Like I mentioned, you know, doing the quiz is a different campaign type than purchases. And then also within that, having different audiences, not relying on just one big one, for example, having different strategies, maybe different click uh, attribution strategies, and those sort of things. So diversification really just means having a structure that isn't relying on one thing. And if you think about it, it's like a portfolio. So in an investing portfolio, you're not going to be putting all your your money into one section of the market, you're going to be having different sections because some might do poor at one point and some might do really well at another point. But if you don't have a diversified, you know, you could do really well and then really bad. But does that mean that if you did have tons of money, then you don't have to diversify? That's that's a tricky question because theoretically, it makes it easier. When you just have more money, you're able to get that learning phase to work. So theoretically, you can have less diversity diversification, but you still need to have some diversity. And that could be testing different products, you know, having different funnels for separate products, having different campaign types, if you want to do top of funnel stuff, and then always having the retargeting broken out. So you can have less diversification when you have a lot of budget, but you still need it no matter what. Most meta reps will recommend only launching campaigns when you're working with an audience of a certain size. I know also like teaching this at the university level, the question is always, does an audience have to be a certain size? Can you use a smaller size? You know, we know we don't want it to be too big. We don't want to be too small. What do you say towards that when it comes to considering audience size? Really, like the claim here is that go broad. And when I say broad, it means literally use like age and gender maybe, and that's all you do. And some people, again, have had success with this, but in our experience, it is very, very seldom successful. What we try to do is also diversify here. So we'll try big audiences. We'll try audiences that are like a million or even into the 500,000 area, depending on if it's like a local campaign or a national campaign. But really the point here is you don't want to, to, to just go broad. You want to make sure that you have a diversified audience, especially going after using interest targeting. Lookalikes are important, but really we see interest targeting do great. Um, you can't really rely on what we see, like some of these big media buyers say, let, let the creative do the targeting for you. Um, that's a big part of it. Creative is the most important part, but you do need to have different audience sizes so you can test different con- like different audiences in terms of interest targeting. You know, you could target different brands that are competitors to yours or general topics that Facebook has. And some of those general topics are going to be really big, but some of those brands are going to be smaller. But they're exactly if they're looking at those brands, they're going to be interested in your product. So it's not always about bigger. It's it's more about like zeroing in on your audience and using what Facebook has and testing a ton of different options. 
because you'll have an audience that could do well and just die out. So you need to have backup audiences. You need to be able to go to those and you need to just test. And that is the big key here is testing. Yeah. So I think just to step back a second to, to sort of explain to the audience who isn't aware. So obviously, if you're spending a lot of money and you're getting a lot of conversions and you play into Facebook's algorithm, so Facebook, that practically means that Facebook or Meta, they're able to then, you know, they see, okay, these 20 people purchased or these 20 people, you know, filled out a lead form. Now we know who they are and now we can go find more of them. And since you're leaning into that, your targeting is not as important. Like Joe said, you know, you could just do target all, you know, 30 to 40 year olds who are male and Facebook can do its thing. But the problem is most people don't have enough conversions or enough money in order to reach those conversions in order to lean into that. So that's why we have to then go ahead and can't rely on that, but we have to find other ways to find, you know, the best, the best clients, the best people are actually going to convert. Exactly. And in just the only other note would be like, this also comes down to how much data you have on your site. So some of these big media buyers, like they have huge brands that are going to have a ton of data that's going to feed back to Facebook and be able to optimize really well. And that can help a lot when you're looking at lookalike audiences. But if you're kind of just starting out or you have low amounts of traffic on the site, like you're not going to be passing a bunch of data back to Facebook. And sometimes even the data like with iOS 14, 17, like it's getting skewed and skewed more every day. That's another part of this is you want to be able to use Facebook's interest targeting to be able to find that audience when you don't have an insane amount of data or budget to be able to rely on to be able to like inform the algorithm completely. Of course, a bigger budget makes things easier, but there are plenty of times, especially when you're dealing with small to medium sized businesses, where a budget is limited. How do you go about testing new strategies, audience, and campaigns in those cases? And I would say maybe prioritize, right? Like definitely. We know that ideally we'd want to have a lot of ads and a lot of campaign types, but how would you approach it? for number one, setting up a campaign, but then also testing things. When I think about like splitting out budget, you know, if you have a smaller budget, you have to think about how many ads you can even have on, right? So you have to minimize the number of ads. You have to go to like maybe four ads at a time when you're testing. So when you launch a campaign, you'll test at four ads and that will dictate like how many audiences you can do. So if you have like a ton of creative and you do want to go to like six ads, you need to limit the number of audiences that you're testing. But usually what we'll do is min- like minimize it to four ads so that we can test other audiences and say we have a really small budget. We're testing like two audiences, but really like the idea would be when you launch, you want to get to like four audiences with four ads in each um, and kind of let the algorithm go and find which one's going to work best so that you can turn off what's not working. That's why it's really important to have like all this these audiences as backups because you're going to find, you know, maybe one of those four work. And, you know, the creative isn't always going to be perfect. So you're going to have to turn off some of that creative and introduce new creative. And you need to be able to introduce new audience as well. So with a smaller budget, a lot of companies or a lot of agencies need to really think about where's the priority. So do you have any recommendations when it comes to investing in retargeting or prospecting? Is there a perfect mix that you like to recommend? So yeah, what I like to do to start is Basically, it depends on if you have a big audience and if this this company has been running for a while, right? If it has a pixel and it has data, you're going to be able to launch a retargeting audience right away. Or they ran campaigns before. But usually at the beginning of a campaign, you're prioritizing the prospecting audience. And we won't even launch with necessarily a retargeting audience to start. But once we get that retargeting audience going from prospecting, and you can do that faster or slower depending on the creative you have. If you have videos, you can get that going way faster. You can use engagement to retarget. But then we'll start breaking out retargeting. And so that budget will then have to filter from prospecting into retargeting. And then you need to prioritize how you want to split up that retargeting. If you're saying in month three and you have like that big engagement audience or video views audience, you're going to want to just kind of combine that and you'll throw in website visitors. It'll be a smaller audience. But then you get to month six and now you have a really good website audience. You have people who've taken other steps like add to your card or initiate checkout or have done some other step right before they convert on that end goal that you're looking for. And then you start splitting those out from warm and you start excluding them from the prospecting audience and the you know warm audience um, and start splitting out website visitors and those higher intent actions like add to cart or initiate checkout. And then you can even go into different timeframes. So that's kind of like the last step is 
in website visitors, you're probably looking to convert the people that are most recent. So you can split out by days. So do seven day retargeting on websites, 30 day website visitors, and even do that with add to carts and initiate checkout when you have time or when you have like that, that length of time that'll give you that audience. And that's really where you start splitting up budget a lot. And you kind of have to prioritize and work with the client on where they're willing to split that budget up. Because this, you still have to feed that funnel. You need to have your, the majority of your budget in prospecting. So initially, like in month three, we'll have 80% of the prospecting budget and then 20% in retargeting. And then we'll go to like maybe 70% in prospecting, 30% in retargeting. And sometimes it goes down to like 60% in prospecting, 40% in retargeting. It all depends on like the progression, your audience size and retargeting. But that's how, you know, beyond prospecting and how you're splitting between audiences, you do need to consider how you split the budget up into retargeting. So in the pre-pandemic world, which we're talking about like the late 2010s, on Facebook and, you know, paid social in general, we had the ability to hyper-target. Literally, I could, you know, target people who ordered um, mochas at Starbucks. <laughs> but as iOS 14 came along, Targeting became a lot not as precise and became a little bit more general. A lot of the options and interests that were available to us went away. I feel like the paid social world, like there was like a pendulum swing. And it's like, okay, before, you know, you could have really bad creative, you know, you know it made no difference. But because yeah. we could target people exactly, it works well. But now, like that, like I said, that pendulum swung the, the opposite way. And people say that creative does the targeting for you, right? Yeah. Like, you know, like, like we said before, general targeting, you don't really have to worry about it. As long as you have a good creative, it's going to work. Kind of like going back to like, um, you know, traditional media where it's like, you know, put a commercial on the, for the Super Bowl, And even though a bunch of people it's not relevant to, but because the creative is so good, it's going to do well. So how do you feel about that claim that creative does the targeting for you? So I definitely don't think it's true. There is some mint like monicum of truth to it. But really, you need good creative no matter what. You need to invest time into it. But you know, you're never going to have like the creative muscle that some of these big companies or agencies have. So you need to be able to, again, test those audiences, but you need to like come up with really a plan for your creative testing. The main thing here is, you know, the creative isn't going to do the targeting for you. You need to have like a plan on how you're going to progress and test that creative. So like, for example, we'll start by testing imagery and video, for example. And then all those assets will be very different concepts so that we can really zero in on which concept is working. And that could be the, the value proposition. It could be the type of ad, meaning it has lifestyle in it. It's maybe more focused on cartoon style ads. But the main point here is that you can't rely on like, for example, putting all your eggs again in one basket of like, let's go and put together the best creative asset we possibly can and only rely on that one. You need to be able to have multiple creative assets and you do need to put time into it, but you need a progression and a plan for how you're going to test that creative. And that's why paid social is a total different word, the world than like uh, paid search. Because, you know, in Google ads, you know, you're bidding on certain keywords, you have ads, you know, I'm, I'm not saying that you, you can't make those ads better, but pretty much when you set something up, it, it lasts pretty well. And it it does well. But in the world of paid social, you know, the lifetime or I guess the life cycle of a piece creative, you know, it could do well for a while, but it could die out really quickly as well. So, you know, imagine if you're in this big agency and you're running these campaigns and you've spent all this time on this creative, you know, these four pieces of creative and suddenly they die out and they just don't work and you, you don't know what's next. You know, it doesn't work. It's not going to work that way, right? And it's a lot harder than, let's say, a Google ad where you could, you know, write up an ad. I think this point that you talk about, like planning and execution, right? You can't just look at the here and now, you know, this initial launch, but the question's also like, what's step two, three, and four? You kind of have to have that in place first. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. You have to have that in place. You know, the main thing that I'm looking at is what is the hypothesis we're trying to prove or disprove? When we have a creative asset, we're looking at what is something we're trying to learn from this. And then we have backup assets that are relevant to that, that we can kind of rotate in based on performance from a winning concept. And then you just try to, try to iterate on that and continue to have like variations on that winning concept. Basically, the way I like to, to see if an ad died out, for example, is to try it. If, it. if it died out in one audience and you try it with another audience and it works, like that ad is not dead. You're basically still going to be able to use it. Um, but when you try it in multiple audiences, you even tried it in retargeting and it's not working anymore. That means like the audience has seen it too much and you have to pivot. But that concept that you saw do well can still work. You just need a variation on it. 
Um, you can even use different copy with that creative asset and see if that aligns differently with performance. But really, like you're trying to find what worked, and then if it dies off, having variations on what did work, so you can con- continue to find winning assets and push that into other audiences. And I feel like because variations are so important, you know, getting that one piece of creative perfect, kind of not worth it, right? Because in your eyes, it might be perfect, but maybe to the audiences, it's not. And therefore, it's more important to have the, those variations than having the one thing that, you know, is like the perfect ad, you know, the perfect creative. Yeah. And then there's a like in between with that. So if you have a good asset and maybe like it has all the things that you wanted, it has like, it's showing the value proposition really well, but maybe that hook is just not working. So you can take components of what you think is a good ad and just try different variations on the hook. You can try different, you know, lengths, you know, shortening it, maybe even making it longer. There is like a max that you want to go to um, of like 30 seconds. Sometimes you want to look at like 10 seconds. But that's really one thing you can do is if you do want to put time into, especially video assets take a lot of time. But if you see something that you're really pumped about and it doesn't perform right away, like you don't want to give up on it. You want to see what maybe was wrong with it and look at KPIs like thumb uh, hold ratio. Like, did they actually stop and look at it? Did they completely just scroll past it? That would indicate the hook is a problem. So theoretically, if you're getting conversions on it died out, you know, don't give up on that creative asset. Just make variations on it, have a different hook. But you do want to put some time into it, but the variations are really important. You have to learn from what you're testing and look at the KPIs and see what maybe the drop off is. If it's on the back end, right? Like you have good front end numbers, meaning like click through rates, hold rates. It could be something to do with your conversion rates and, and really looking at like the landing page. Is that an issue? Um, is there a bad customer journey? Is the product not what they're looking for? Cause that's a big part of this too, is you're highlighting specific products in your creative. If it's, you know, for example, an e-commerce business that has multiple products, you kind of are testing products at some point. If it's a service, you know, you're trying to show multiple value propositions in it. So that can get a little bit more complex, but you know, you're looking at a lot of different things in the KPIs and seeing where the problem is so you can address it. So just to give our listeners an idea, because we're talking a lot about like either campaigns, audiences, or ad sets that are dying out. What time limit do you kind of give to things to say, oh, you know, this is this is dead? Are you, are you looking at like 30 days to decide whether something doesn't work anymore? Is it seven days? Is there a rule of thumb? I don't know if it's different between ads versus audiences, but any advice there? Yeah, so it really depends on your statistical significance. So you have to let it run for a certain period of time. Like if it's high spending, I'll do seven days. Um, but if it's like a lower spending client, you got to give it like 14 to 30 days. And really what I'm looking at is basically the cost per lead or the cost for the cost for acquisition, cost for purchase. If it's double or triple what you're looking for or what the average in the account is for that 30 days or seven days. And even really looking at where it is in the funnel. If it's, you know, your prospecting KPIs are going to be different than your retargeting KPIs. And you have to look at everything in, in these segmented ways. But really like, for example, if you have a prospecting ad or audience that is basically double or triple your KPI that you're looking for, that means it's not doing well. And if it's spent double what your KPI is, then you definitely know it's not a good one without a conversion. You need to turn it off. So, you know, it does really depend on the statistical significance and how much budget you do have. Um, but if something goes to that double or triple KPI that you're looking for, it's time to move on. But how do you know when to move on or just, oh, let's try more creative? Like, is there, is there a fork in the road to make that decision? Yeah. So really, like, if an audience has done well in the past and it starts to sign off, like, we will try to put some new creative in there and we'll try to make it work. And that does definitely work. But when you see like new creative is going in there and that creative that you launched in another campaign is doing really well for audience, then you know that that is a big problem with this audience. And if it's been running for a long time, then that's a big indication that that audience is saturated. Um, and you can look at like the impression share and see like, okay, this has hit like 40% of our audience to 60%. And you know that there's definitely a problem with it. And you can either hold off on it retire it, go to another audience. Um, but that's really what I'm looking at is does creative, if you have an audience that did well and there's creative that is working in other audiences, if it doesn't work in that audience, then that's when you're making that decision. Um, but you don't want to give up on an audience right away just because it has like, you know, really bad numbers, especially if it did well in the past. You do want to try to get some, some creative in there and try to really make sure that it is not going to work. But there are times where if you do have other audiences that are doing really well, that's another consideration. Like, it could be on the edge and it could be like barely worse than the other ones. But that's another big consideration on budget is if I have one that's doing really well and this one's doing okay, I'd 
probably need to turn it off because I can allocate that budget to something that's doing really well. There's a real golden nugget there because basically what we're saying here is there's a huge advantage of having multiple audiences and multiple ad sets, right? Exactly. Because not not only, you know, if one dies out, then you've got others, but it's actually, you're able to take creative and it's kind of like a, a barometer, an indicator, right? It, it allows you to really know, is the creative working or is it not working, right? Uh, if you just had one audience, you would not you would never know. But if you have more, you can see, okay, if it's working there, it's not working here, then there's a problem. It's funny because I never really thought that way. Yeah, and, and, and we look at creative across like multiple audiences. We're looking at it in generally and at the audience level too. So like we, you'll have a creative that can go in prospecting across multiple audiences, or even sometimes you're using it in prospecting and retargeting with like different copy and prospecting being longer, for example, because you're giving more information and in retargeting it's less. But we're looking at that creative across everything and seeing how it's doing. And if it's doing really well across everything, but not in one audience, like, you know, there's a problem there and vice versa. So would you say the days of making specific creative for a specific audience or specific ad set are kind of over. You kind of need to create creative that's going to work over multiple audiences because getting that intel on how the creative is doing across multiple audiences is going to be a lot more valuable. Definitely. Yeah. I think there's def- there's there's times where you need retargeting specific creative, like you need unboxing videos for sure in retargeting um, CEOs talking about their business and retargeting. But really, like in prospecting, you want this this creative to go across multiple audiences. There are some times where if you have a specific product, for example, that that is aligned with a specific gender, for example, like you know we do a campaign for Brian Gavin Diamonds where we're looking for engagement rings. Now we have like a top of funnel campaign that is like a quiz, and that has men and women in it. But when we're looking for purchases, we are going straight after men in that, you know, we are talking to them specifically about buying it for your future spouse. So in that scenario, we still need to talk to men, but we still have audiences that we're going, we have different audiences for men that it needs to apply to across all of those. So I know you and your team spend a lot of time making sure you have good tracking and just in general that the accounts are set up um, in, a, in a good way. Um, why is that so important? before launching? Besides just having like good research and good creative development, you need to have your pixel on the site and tracking well. We've seen scenarios where there's duplicate events that are happening and like the data that we're getting might be overinflated. You know, if that's because your pixel is set up incorrectly, it can really lead to you optimizing incorrectly. Setting it up to start and like testing it and making sure doing quality control on that is super important and not just like only relying on what you see in Facebook. You need to go on the back end And you need to go into Google Analytics, Shopify, uh, Triple Whale, any attribution tool that you have that's going to validate what you see in in the platform itself. Um, That's really important. But this all starts with trusting what you see in Facebook and putting time and effort into really making sure that the pixel is firing correctly and it's on your site before you even start the campaign. Because you want to have uh, Facebook being able to take that data and find people who are going to be doing similar things to that. And the audiences are going to help you a lot, but you really do need to have that pixel working well with Facebook to optimize directly and make decisions off of it. So we know in any sort of paid advertising, at first glance, people are going to look at success on how many leads they got and what that cost per lead was. But we know at Optage and other agencies that it's not just about the number of leads or the cost of that lead, but it's also about the quality. Can you share with the audience a little bit more of why it's so important to look in the back end and to see the quality of those leads? From a lead generation standpoint, it is the most crucial thing you can do. So what we'll do is we have a Zapier connection going into a Google Sheet, for example, or even going into like HubSpot. And we're able to see which audience and creative was driven for that lead. And we're able to see the quality of that lead and what converted. So it does take time to like get this data and you need to really have a good relationship with the sales team. But being able to go and see which audience and ad is delivering the best quality is absolutely crucial because you can see really good numbers in Facebook, but those numbers might not be a good example of what quality is. So if you have, for example, a $5 cost per lead in Facebook and then an audience that's a $10 cost per lead, but you go into the back end and see that the audience that had a $10 cost per lead is actually converting at like double the conversion rate of the one that has a lower cost per lead, you're going to want to double down on that one that has a better conversion rate. So if you don't have that information or aren't looking at that, you literally cannot make that decision correctly. One other controversy that comes up is a lot of people claim that using bid caps and target CPA or ROAS is the only way to control costs and run Facebook ads profitably. 
So if you could first translate that for the, you know, more of the basic user, what does it mean using bid caps and target CPAs? And then is that true or is it not true? There are definitely times where you can make this work. It just, it requires so much effort to be able to do this. You need different pipelines. Um, but really the general concept would be that you give Facebook a goal for the cost per purchase that you need, for example. And if that goal for, you know, to make your ads profitable is a hundred dollars, for example, Facebook will only show those ads to people that think they are going to be converting at that cost. So number one, it means that you might basically not be able to spend anything. You might have to come up with different product like pipelines, meaning you need to look at like, we need to come up with a pipeline for and funnel for this specific product and have creative and test creative. And you have to cycle through a bunch of creative to see if that creative and audience is going to work with that cost cap. And you end up just in a situation where you can not spend anything. That comes down to like, if you have really good numbers in terms of like conversion events and have that feeding back to Facebook really well, and you have amazing creative and have a bunch of offers and pipelines that you can create, like you can make it work. But what I usually like to do is start with max delivery or lowest cost and then see what those numbers are giving us because usually they'll be a little bit higher than where you can get to and optimize to. So you, by turning off ads and audiences that are not performing well, you can decrease that cost per purchase and get it to where you need to be without impacting your delivery and coming up with all these really, really intricate funnels and um, things that make it really hard to operate on a day-to-day. In scenarios where we do want to use this, it's where we get that initial cost per purchase and you know we're able to kind of work with that with lowest cost and we see what that cost per purchase is and then we'll try using that cost per purchase on a cap, cost cap on an audience that we know did well. So we'll test it but we need to find what that base cost per purchase is going to be because it might not align with what the business goals are right away. And we can get that cost per purchase down without using cost caps. Awesome. Well, Joe, thank you so much for debunking some of these (laughs) myths or things that we're hearing all the time from experts and from those meta reps themselves. Now it's time for our lightning round. I'm going to give you a category and I'd love to hear who do you think about when I talk about this? Who are some influencers or who is the top influencer that you like to follow? So I really like Nick Shackleford. He's really knowledgeable on a wide range of things. You know, he doesn't rely on certain things like cost caps. Um, he's very diversified in strategies. Mason Littlejohn, you know, Taylor Holiday, David Herman is kind of like a, a legacy guy in the business. Um, he really kind of is is really good at pushing the not every strategy is going to work for everyone, and you need like paid social. This is the biggest takeaway: is, is an art. You need to test a bunch of different things. You need to see what works for your campaign. Um, and he really does push that in a great way. Maxwell Finn is a great on like bigger strategies in e-com. Andrew Ferris, uh, Actville, DeFazio, Molly Pittman, Ezra Firestone. So there's a ton of different people that you can go look up and follow on Twitter. I follow them on Twitter, LinkedIn, everywhere I can to consume as much information from them as possible. Um, but those are some of the people I follow. Super. And for those who don't know, Akvila was actually a guest on the podcast and we'll put a link to her episode below. Absolutely. Talking about podcasts. So what are some podcasts that you like to follow? It could be uh, either in the world of paid social or just you know what you like to listen to. So I really like this kind of startup company called The Dispatch for like current events. I like how I build this with Guy Raz. It, it really shows like business strategy and some of the biggest businesses out there where they've had success and failures and how they were able to make their business work in the end. For some of the like the paid media stuff, I would recommend Perpetual Traffic, Social Media Marketing Talk Show, the e-commerce influence podcast, Ad Spend, which is Ash Milana, Milani, and e-commerce Titan. So some of those are the ones that I listen to to just get into the know on strategies for paid social. That's awesome. Those are really good recommendations. What about TV show or uh, streaming show? So right now, like I was just watching the David Beckham documentary on Netflix. I thought that was great. I'm really into documentaries, honestly. Awesome. And then finally, sports. I know uh, we didn't talk about this at the beginning of the episode, but uh, you did a little bit of college sports. So what what sort of sports are you into now? So yeah, I play rugby in college and high school. I'm been following the Rugby World Cup. I'm a big fan of Ireland and they just lost in the quarterfinals and they've never gotten past that when they're the number one team in the world. So that was sad. Um, and then watching the Astros and the ALCS and that is also sad because they've lost the first two games at home and I don't know how that's going to go, but hopefully they turn around when they go to the uh, Rangers field. Yeah, and we'll see um, when this episode airs. We'll see who's in the World Series. Hopefully <laughs> yeah. the Astros. Yeah, that's true. 
So Joe, where can listeners learn more about you and the different things you do in paid social? On the Optage site, um, on the Optage LinkedIn page. I have an email at joseph at optage.com that you can reach out to at any time. We push out content all the time. Um, we have blogs, we have topics of discussion that we, we go over. Um, so you can find it anywhere. And what would you say is your next big project that you're working on? It could be personal or for the department. So this, the next project that we're working on that's pretty big is for um, a company called Recognition Media. It's the Tele Awards. We do basically all of their awards. They have multiple ones. They're part of the Webby um, Award group. And this one's focused on television and media and video development. So that one is a pretty big spending project. And um, I'm really looking forward to that one. We're going to be able to test a lot of different things. Um, and we've had success with them in the past. So looking for another great season there. Love it. Yeah, people don't realize that Joe is an expert in the w- world of you know, award shows and yeah. paid social. So hey, Oscars and Emmys, if you're looking for True. someone to do your paid social... Joe's man. We would love to do it. All right. Well, this has been a wonderful conversation. A lot of golden nuggets. And I'm sure everyone who listens is going to really walk away with uh, good next steps and a good perspective on what to listen to when they hear, you know, sort of about the next latest thing when it comes to paid social. Thank you, Joe, for being a guest on the Digital Marketing Mentor. Thank you, listeners, for tuning into the Digital Marketing Mentor. We'll talk with you next time. Thank you for listening to the Digital Marketing Mentor podcast. Be sure to check us out online at the dmmentor.com and at the dm mentor on Instagram and don't forget to subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts for more marketing mentor magic. See you next time.